coming up. We're gonna go behind the top 10 songs of this very same week from the year 1982. You know, we've done a lot of these Redux episodes on this channel, it's my favorite. I gotta say though, today's show might have them all beat. It's absolutely stacked with great songs. I mean, when comparing it to today's top hits, you almost wanna cry. I mean, seriously, how far we've fallen. I don't wanna spoil the surprise, but this time around there are some serious countdown contenders including what may be the heaviest hitting movie theme song of all time. Now throw in a supergroup blockbuster smash, some of New Wave's finest British invaders, and you know some surprise underdogs. It's gonna be a real fight to the finish to see who comes out on top, coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever counted them down with Casey Kasem, this is your channel. Uh, make sure that you subscribe below right now to be a part of our Music History Daily, straight from the artist. And this, uh, this show is a tip of the hat to old Casey. It's time for another edition of our show, The Hit Song Redux. This is where we travel back to a week in the golden era of rock and roll. And we re-rank the top 10 songs of that specific week based on how much the world has listened to them since their peak position on the Billboard Hot 100. As always, we're including artist interviews, in-depth commentary from them, as well as your stories, your dedications. Uh, now, just to clarify, this is not my personal top 10. It's the actual top 10 from this exact week, 40 years ago. You know, first, we count them down as they were, as they were then. Now we run them through a recalibration process to find out the real top 10 based on all time streams and views. This one has to be one of the best top fives in history. You'll see. So to place us in the proper pop culture context of the day, if you wanted to catch a movie on this exact week in the year 1982, you'd have to stand in a very long line in the cinema you could see the box office leader, E.T., which would become the number one movie ever, at least for a while. E.T., the extraterrestrial. Or you could witness Sylvester Stallone's third installment of the Rocky franchise. I'll bust you up. Go for it. Sylvester Stallone. Of course, there was Harrison Ford's Blade Runner as well. They were looking for me. Man, what a great time to be alive. On the boob tube, you could catch the first season of Late Night with David Letter. We have a wonderful show for you folks this evening. Uh, comedian Bill Murray will be joining us a little bit later. Could watch summer reruns from the first season of T.J. Hooker. <laughs> and the last season of WKRP in Cincinnati. The WKRP in Cincinnati. Saturday morning cartoons were also all the fun, the rage with Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Smurfs. You may just catch a glimpse of the Smurfs. Do that while trying to figure out your Rubik's Cube. All right, enough nostalgia, let's get started. So coming in at number 10, it's a Southern rock band that started to make some noise in the top 10 after their stellar song, Hold On Loosely, came up a little bit short. It's Caught Up In You by 38 Special. Caught Up In You was the first single released from 38 Special's 1982 album, Special Forces. Though it would rise to number one on the Billboard rock chart, it would peak here at the top 10, uh, at number 10 on the Hot 100. Here's what the song's writers had to say about it. Yeah, I was dating this, this woman and I said, and I said, ah, I just, I can't get any work done. I'm just, I'm just so caught up in you all the time. Jim Peter, you know, I have to, Hats off to him. He was always great, great collaborator. Ever ask me twice? Oh no. But that's the best bridge I ever wrote. And then it comes back, and that was their brilliant stroke in the studio. They brought that bridge back, yeah. half of it, after the, the solo. Coming in at number nine, it's a remake of a 60s soul song that became one of the defining songs of the 80s with its synth pop magic. It's Soft Cell with Tainted Love. Tainted love. Oh, tainted love. You know, this is a song that just sends an electric shock through your system every time you hear it. It's pure 80s synth ear candy. 
Now, the duo of Soft Cell, it was comprised of vocalist Mark Almond and instrumentalist Dave Ball. Uh, describing the song, Mark said it was a mixture of cold electronics with an overpassionate, over exuberant, slightly out of key vocal, which is a perfect match for the I love you, though you hurt me so lyrics. about a toxic relationship that you just can't seem to leave behind. Tainted Love, of course, were originally recorded by Gloria Jones. That was in 1964. Tainted Love. Tainted Love. Written by Ed Cobb. He said, I had a lover for whom you could say wasn't a good individual. Tried to go into her head and write a song from her standpoint. Once the word tainted had popped into my head, the song was written really quickly, probably 15 minutes. The song was actually a B-side to begin with and never seized the spotlight until the British synth pop duo gave its unforgettable new wave sound. Away, the soft cell version, no doubt about it, should have been a number one hit in the US, but didn't quite make it. It went to number eight. It did, however, reach number one in the UK where the band had a much more successful career. Not surprisingly, we received a lot of comments about this synth pop classic. I love this one that viewer Brian Zirkel shared. He said, I remember hearing Tainted Love for the first time on a Walkman with the batteries running out. I thought the song was so super dark and dreary. Then I heard it on the radio and it took a few listens to realize I'd heard it warped that first time. <laughs> I was young and dumb then, but I still can't hear it without remembering on super slow. That's funny. Screen name Flavinator said, We used to play Tainted Love, Where Did Our Love Go? when I worked at the skating rink back in 1981 for two reasons. One, it was popular and synth pop was just growing its wings. And two, it was nine minutes long so we could leave the DJ booth or skate room and go roll around for a little bit. And viewer Prime Usha said, During the lockdown, 2020, my teenage daughter fell in love with Tainted Love, playing it over and over again, loud enough for me to hear it blasting from her ear pods. Uh, throughout the year, we would just blast it in the kitchen together and dance while doing dishes. Perfect blend of nostalgia and new life. Couldn't agree more. Okay, coming in at the number eight spot, it's a song about living together in harmony. It was so popular, it was parodied on Saturday Night Live. You had Joe Piscopo as Frank Sinatra and uh, Eddie Murphy as Stevie Wonder. Ebony That's and good. Ivory yeah, good just living in it's Ebony and Ivory by Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder. Ebony and Ivory. Released in April 1982, this duet spent time, uh, seven weeks actually, at number one, making it to McCartney's 28th chart top. title was inspired by McCartney hearing English comedian Spike Milligan say, black notes, white notes, and you need to play the two to make harmony, folks. Paul liked the piano analogy, since you need to combine the two to make great music. Now, after McCartney started recording the song as a solo effort to start, and ivory. he thought it would be a little bit better as a duet. Stevie Wonder would make a perfect partner for this particular song. Stevie accepted after hearing the demo, and it's a good thing too, because even musical geniuses need a little help every once in a while. I guess during the recording process, Stevie Wonder actually had to call Paul out for his hand claps being out of time. Or as McCartney put it, they weren't in the pocket. And you better believe I got it in the pocket. Uh, two musical geniuses working together, it's amazing. The single was issued on McCartney's 1982 album, Tug of War, and it became one of history's most memorable calls for racial harmony. Now, as we arrive at the number seven position, I do want to recognize our sponsor, Zenni Eyewear, the rock star choice for glasses. You want to feel like a rock star? Zenni is the only way to go. Go to zenni.com, choose your color, your shape, your style, the rest is history. You're gonna look marvelous. Check it out today at zenny.com. So at the number seven position, it's an artist who is a little bit country, but crossed over several times and did it this time with Love's Been a Little Bit Hard On Me by Juice Newton. 
Juice Newton was part of the first wave of country singers uh, raised on rock, folk rock, and singer-songwriters. There's Angel of the Morning. Just call me Angel of the Morning. And Queen of Hearts. Playing with the Queen of Hearts. No one in it really smart. Two of her pop crossover hits. Both of those have country pop arrangements, but are influenced by 60s pop and new wave roots rock. And she continued the pop crossover hits in the early 80s with uh, Love's Been a Little Bit Hard on Me, written by the great Gary Burr. This was the first single from Newton's seventh studio album, Quiet Lies, which released in the spring of 82. Love's Been a Little Bit Hard on Me tells the story of a girl reluctant to get back out there and commit to a relationship. Lyrically, she tries to, to coax herself out of the shade so dark and into the light, but always comes back to the song's title for proof as to why she shouldn't. Though the hurt cited in the song is emotional, the music video plays for physical comedic effect, showing uh, Juice Newton in a series of accidental injuries instigated by her lover. Her leg gets caught in a car door, and she takes one of her crutches to the face, and finally she rolls backwards off a cliff in a wheelchair. The final shot shows Juice singing from her hospital bed in full body cast. The video was actually awarded Video of the Year by the American Video Association in 82. Those early 80s videos, you gotta love them. Coming in at the number six position on the countdown, we have Daz Band with Let It Whip. Out of Cleveland, Ohio, Daz Band was an American R&B funk band. Uh, the word Daz is actually emerging of the phrase danceable jazz. Let It Whip, taken from their second album, Keep It Live, and won a Grammy Award for Best Performance by an R&B Vocal Duo or Group. Let's just be honest here, man. Let It Whip is insanely catchy. You know, it's an irresistible pounding bass line. It's energetic vocals and good time sing-along lyrics. You have to have a uh, seriously bad day not to enjoy this song. Even if you're having a bad day, it'll, it'll bring you up. In conjunction with the music, the song also featured some funky dance choreography. I guess it was the plan of producer uh, and the Daz band to try and start a dance craze, but unfortunately, never caught on. And while Daz Band never reached Let It Whip's heights again, they did put together a string of six consecutive top 100 albums up until 1986, and they scored two other top 100 singles, Joystick and Let It All Blow. Adam Reeder, the Professor of Rock here. Don't miss the next Professor of Rock Live show on Saturday, July 16th at the Eccles Center in Park City. An exclusive evening of story and song with Lou Graham, the voice of Foreigner. Lou Graham, a Professor of Rock Live, sharing never before told stories and performing Foreigner's biggest hits. Get your tickets for Professor of Rock Live at parkcityinstitute.org. Professor of Rock Live with Lou Graham, the voice of Foreigner, July 16th at the Eccles Center in Park City. Presented by the Park City Institute. Okay, so we've made it halfway through the countdown and going into the number five spot. It's one of the greatest movie anthems of all time. Every 80s kid knows this one by heart and it motivated one Rocky Balboa to defeat Clubber Lang. It's Eye of the Tiger by Survivor. Survivor formed in 1978. Jim Peterick, man, keyboard and guitar, and the band had their first top 40 hit with Poor Man's Son. Poor man's son. I went to number 33, and after that, Destiny hit big time. As Jim Peterick would tell me in an interview that I've done with him, he came home to find an unbelievable message on his answering machine. Hey, yo, Jim, uh, give me a call, Sylvester Stallone. That's my best impression, sorry. Immediately, Peterick thought, yeah, right. Thought it was maybe a French playing a joke. But after his uh, wife, Karen, convinced him to call the number back, someone answered the phone with just a yo. It was definitely Stallone. He told Jim to call him Sly. <laughs> P. 
Peter described it as a surreal moment. Like the rest of us, he was a fan and he loved the first two Rocky movies. Turns out Stallone was a fan of Survivor and he wanted them to cut a song for Rocky III. He said he wanted something street, you know, something for the kids. Hey, can you help me out? So Stallone sent Jim the first three minutes of the movie. That's the montage where Mr. T's Clubber Lang is on the rise and you know, Rocky's shooting commercials. So he started scoring you know, the punches in the montage with the chords. But he didn't know where to go from there. So he gave Sly a call. He told him, you know, I need the whole movie. And after some back and forth, Sly Stallone relented and said, okay, but you got to send it right back. So he FedExed it over the very next day. I mean, can you imagine? This is before anybody had ever seen it. After watching the rest of the movie, things really started to click. The line from Apollo about needing to have the eye of the tiger, it jumped out to him. Now, when we fought, you had that eye of the tiger, man, the edge. And Jim told his bandmate Frankie that they'd be idiots if they didn't name that the title. And soon they had the lyrics to this music just pounded out. Five days later, they were in the studio cutting the demo, which incidentally is the version that you hear in the movie. Such a great story. It's one of the great rock and roll stories of all time. I love this song. So do you as the viewers. You had a lot to say about it. For example, viewer Clarissa Thompson said, Eye of the Tiger will always make me remember my brother doing an air band performance when we were kids. He's the first person I think of when this song starts playing. Viewer uh, Robert Chattel. Well, for me personally, Rocky III was the very first Rocky Balboa film that I'd seen in the theater by myself. I was 11 at the time. To this day, it is still my all-time favorite Rocky movie, Without a shadow of a doubt, and the cherry on top is, of course, Eye of the Tiger by Survivor. It was on the radio all the time, well past the theatrical run of Rocky III. It's still on the radio, right? Up, back on the street. Viewer Michael Schroek, I hope I said your name right, he said, back in grade school when Eye of the Tiger came out, our music teacher was big on teaching us current tunes. He learned how to play them on the piano and gave us all lyric sheets, and we sang them in class. For Eye of the Tiger, I stole the lyric sheet and I took it home to memorize it. I would climb to the top of the tallest tree I could navigate and would belt the song out loud. I have kind of a funny story about Eye of the Tiger, actually quite a few memories, but one I'll share. Uh, it happened a few years ago. One time when I was really sick with pneumonia, I was bedridden and it hit at the worst time because we were moving out of our house into a new one and my wife had to do most of the packing because I, I had no energy. I was so sick. She asked me to do one thing, to change a light bulb above our bed. So I stood up and I tried desperately for like 20 minutes to change that light bulb, but I was so beat I couldn't do it. I was sopping wet from the sweat. I was useless. So I put on Eye of the Tiger, I blasted it, and I found the motivation to change that freaking light bulb. And it worked. Of course it did. It's Eye of the Tiger, baby. The tiger. Heading into the number four spot, it's the first single from one of the biggest blockbuster albums of 1982. It's Heat of the Moment by Asia. It was the heat of the moment. According to both Billboard and Cashbox, it was the number one album in the U.S. that year, beating out the likes of ACDC, Foreigner, Fleetwood Mac, Paul McCartney, and Men at Work. Formed a year earlier in 1981 by former members of Yes, King Crimson, and Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Heat of the moment, well, number four is as far as it would go on the Hot 100, but it did go to number one on the U.S. mainstream rock chart. What were the things you wanted for? Here's what co-writer and keyboardist Jeff Downs said about the song. I had a, a verse uh, part that, that was actually in 6-4. You so it's sort of unusual for a pop record to be in anything other than 4-4. Obviously it squares off to 4-4 when it hits the chorus, uh, but then it breaks back into 6-4 when it hits the verse. It's a sort of a fairly unusual approach, but I think it it really helped the song flow. You know, I think that that uh, it, it was all based on a kind of uh, 
I think they call it the iambic pentameter. So you know, it's, uh, yeah. uh, that's how it. That's how it. Uh, you know, we approached it. All right, we're getting closer to that coveted number one slot. And in at number three, we have one of America's finest singer-songwriters. Uh, to me, the Walt Whitman of Generation X. It's Heard So Good by John Mellencamp. Come on, baby, make it hurt so good. Like I said, John Mellencamp was a leading voice for Americans in the 80s with uh, life-affirming songs like Jack and Diane. About Jack and Diane. And check it out. Pink houses. Small town. And cherry bomb, just to name a few. I mean, Billboard magazine called him the most important roots rocker of his of his generation. And Johnny Cash called him one of the 10 best songwriters in music. And it's just so true. John was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2008. Also the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2018. And he holds the record for the solo artist uh, with the, the most number one mainstream rock chart hits. He reached the top seven times, I believe. Hurt So Good was the first single from his fifth album, American Fool, the one that really made him break out. Mellencamp said he wrote this song in three minutes and initially thought of it as a joke. You know, something along the lines of a Shel Silverstein. So to... When he described what inspired the song, it took on a deeper meaning. He said, when I first started playing in rock bands, I didn't realize how crude and mean other fellows could be. Now, how crude they were with women and how crude women were. That led me to write a song called Hurt So Good because I, I was playing in these bars and I just couldn't believe the lows people would go with each other. Well, as low as some people might sink, the song itself ascended high up on the charts. It peaked at number two on the Hot 100 and it went all the way to number one on the Cashbox 100, which in some ways is uh, better because it sells. It's really what the people were buying. It was the breakthrough that he was looking for. So, all right, we, we've made it to, to number two, the runner-up position. It's one of my personal favorites from a band that brings new meaning to the words technically proficient. It's about a Hollywood actress. It's Rosanna by Toto. Rosanna, Rosanna, this is the, the first Toto song that I remember hearing as a child. I think I was like six or seven years old. I couldn't believe my ears. I was... I was witnessing absolute pop perfection. I'll never forget when my dad came home with a record. I must have listened to it a hundred times in the first week. It's just mesmerized. Over the years, I've had the privilege of interviewing the members of Toto multiple times. I have to tell you, not only are they some of the greatest songwriters and musicians in history, but they're just, they're also incredible storytellers and, and human beings. And the story behind Rosanna, it's really good. Here it is. Without the band and this collaborative effort, it's a different song. That mm -hmm. would be a totally different song right now because that was going to be a Bo Diddley kind of groove in the front. Right. And Jeff just defined that by playing that entry. Well, Jeff's no. on YouTube teaching people how to play. How to play. Have you ever seen that? Putting them together, this is what it came up with. We didn't rehearse. rehearse. We never rehearsed our stuff. Yeah. Dave, what do you got? Dave, yeah. got, we heard you playing the song. And, and then Jeff goes, well, I mean, he, Jeff had been listening to Led's Up and Fool on the Hill. That and Bernard Purdy's Babylon System. Yeah. So I've he seen. sort of did his version of that. I had been listening to, to Panic in Detroit with Bowie, so I wanted this. Doom, 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 doom. <laughs> Jeff just took one look. He didn't even play that. He tried it about one bar of it and said, no. He goes, let me tell you, this is how this needs to be. And he didn't sit down and analyze that like he does on the YouTube thing. He just started playing that. Yeah, yeah he was just right on the spot. We were at Sound, and then Hongi was there, and we and was, he played the song. We wrote a really quick chord to yeah, it, yeah, and yeah. the second take is what you hear. That's yeah. the record. Yeah. Gosh. With the solos and everything. Yeah, I mean, that's the, all, the whole that, vamp was never supposed I mean, to happen. that's a, yeah. one of the first memories I have of hearing a rock and roll song yeah. where I was just like, yeah. what the hell At is At the end that? of that, we went you like, you, did you get that? <laughs> 
All right, we're here. We've made it to the top of the summit, top of the cliff, the number one song for this same week in 1982, 40 years ago. Can you believe it? It's a song that hit the top five all over the world, and it went to number one in eight different countries. It was one of the early warning shots of the second British invasion. It's Don't You Want Me by the Human League. Don't you want me, baby. The Human League originated in Sheffield, England back in 1977. They went on to release a slew of synth dance pop hits in the 80s and 90s. Phil Oakley is the only core member of the group, as his original bandmates all left due to infighting. Oakley retained the band name, but instead of recruiting experienced musicians for replacements, he chose two teenage girls discovered at a local discotheque, Suzanne Sully and Joanne Catherall. They had never sung professionally before that moment, but Oakley must have seen something in them because this new incarnation of Human League had a lot of success. As a in a bar. Phil Oakley has said that Don't You Want Me is not a love song. It's all about power politics between two people. That's notable for its use of a double point of view. Uh, the song follows trading perspectives in a, a relationship that has fallen apart. Don't, don't you want me? You know I... The song starts out from the guy's perspective, who sings about meeting a cocktail waitress and turning her into a star. As a waitress in a cocktail bar. But now that she's famous, she wants nothing to do with him. It's clear, however, that she's not buying his story and when it's her turn to sing, she has a very different tell to tell. But now I think it's time I live my life on my Our viewers had a lot of fun memories of this one as well. Screen name Hugo and me said, Summer 82, I had just graduated high school, and my summer job was babysitting a six-month-old all day. Five days a week in the middle of nowhere. The best part of my day was when they played music videos at noon. Not sure what the show was called, but it wasn't MTV. I remember loving Asia's music. When I finally get to hang out with my friend in the evening, I must have complained about my job a lot. I changed the lyrics of Don't You Want Me to I Don't Want No Babies. <laughs> you can't make me know. Sorry, don't you want me, baby? Pure Glenn Jones said Don't You Want Me was the soundtrack to my last year at school and revision for exams over the Christmas break. Six months later, I'd left school, I got a job, and I started spending money on buying it like my life depended on it. I know what you mean. I must have bought several versions of Dare on the different formats over the years. A fair chunk of my wages in the first year went on 12-inch singles, colored vinyl, and picture discs, versions of everything released from the Dare album. Screen name DAC said, summer of 1982, I was 12 years old and I just started to notice the girls at the lake. Don't You Want Me was all over the radio. It's one of a number of songs from that era like Centerfold by Jay Giles. We got the beat by the Go-Go's. And Jack and Diane by then, just John Cougar. Had my first kiss under the pontoon raft that we all used to hang out on in the lake. Sort of the end of the innocence. So there's a lot of nostalgia when I hear this particular song. Don't you want me, baby? I know what you mean. This is one of the first songs that, that blew my mind as a kid. Uh, I heard it come over the overhead speaker when I was at the swimming pool with my family. And I had to know who sang this song. It started my, my first conquest into music discovery. Well, there you have it. The top 10 songs from this very same week in 1982. So let's go ahead and put them through our recalculation system, which focuses on all-time streams, radio plays, and views. All right, drum roll, please. Here is the new top 10. And number 10, it's Love's Been a Little Bit Hard on Me by Juice Newton with 7 million streams. Coming in at number nine, it's a Daz band with Let It Whip, 41 million streams. Holding pat at number eight, it's the duo of McCartney and Wonder with Ebony and Ivory having garnered 64 million streams. 
Next at number seven, 38 Specials Caught Up in You moves up three spots with 119 million streams. At number six, it's Heat of the Moment by Asia with a 148 million streams. It was the heat of the moment. Halfway through at number five, John Mellencamp's Hurt So Good, it checks in with 242 million streams. Come on, baby, make it hurt so at number four, it's Rosanna by Toto with 358 million streams. Rosanna. Number three, it's the former number one, falling two spots from the original countdown, Don't You Want Me by the Human League, turning in half a billion, 515 million streams. This means we'll have a new number one song. Don't you want me, baby? And number two, it's Tainted Love with an incredible 553 million streams. So that means that the new number one song is Eye of the Tiger by Survivor. Jumping forward four spots, it was no contest. This Rocky three heavy hitter delivered a knockout blow with a staggering two billion streams. That's more than the rest of the countdown combined. So there it is, the new top 10 from this very same week, good old 1982, based on all time streams and views. It makes today's top 10 look pretty bad. Here's a little comparison if you don't believe me. A quick reminder to support us on Patreon to keep this a daily channel. The link is below. Make sure to share your memories of these songs. What do you think about the new top 10? If we didn't get to your dedication or your memory, we will. Keep sharing them with us in the comments below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. To get these albums, click on our links below. We're going to link to all those. And don't forget, again, Patreon and our merch. Help us keep the music alive. That's the idea. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.